Hello everyone, welcome to Chess with Lisa. Today we will be going over one of my students' games uh, that was played earlier. I do want to make a mention that I will be starting a YouTube series on my um, analysis of my students' games uh, when they play the Nimzo Larsen pack or the Sicilian Dragon. But I will also be creating another um, series of games where I will be playing the Nimzo Larsen and the Sicilian Dragon and explaining my thought process. I hope you guys will enjoy the series, and in the future I will be creating a breakdown of the Nimzo Larsen opening. Uh, that should be uh, finished. Hope you enjoy these videos though for now. Okay. My student starts off with B3, which is amazing. You always start off with B3 if you want to take advantage of the of if you want to take full advantage of the opening, I do recommend to play B3 first move. Um, the idea is that you give up the center control, but it actually leads to a lot of different uh, traps, tricks in the opening. Of course, you want, you can start off with knight to f3 or pawn to e, uh, or you can transpose or start off with d4 or c4. However, as mentioned, you want the full potential of the opening, start off with b first. Okay, so e5, e3. Now, e3, I usually play on move, uh, on, uh, on move 3 instead of move because I do prefer the move. Why? Because when you are playing white, you have the first move. It's nice to try to make aggressive moves. And especially since the very first move that we've made, uh, well, white has made in the game, um, uh, is b3 and not controlling the center. That's why playing something like bishop 2 2 would be a good idea because now the bishop is attacking the pawn on which means that black has to react. When you're playing white, it's good to be the aggressor, which means making attacking moves. Knight c6, bishop goes to b2. It's not really a big deal, by the way. Totally not a big deal. Um, it's totally fine to transpose. Uh, it's just my preference. Black plays bishop to b4. Bishop b4 is a very, very weird move, in my opinion. It's not really attacking anything. It's looking at this pawn on d2. It's not attacking the pawn. This pawn on d2 has enough defenders. It has three defenders, so it would be a really bad idea for black to capture the pawn on d2, and that would be a loss of two points. Bishop is worth three points, and pawn is worth one. 3 minus 1 is 2, losing 2 points. So in the Nimzo Larsen open, like after you've uh, gotten to your setup, a lot of the time you play on the queen side, and we're going to play a3 and b4 in the future anyways. So by playing bishop to b4, this actually helps white to play a3 right away. And also in the future, by playing a3, we might, or white, I just mean, when I say we, it's because I do play this opening. But I mean, um, like, I might, or my student might, right, decide to potentially play something like bishop d3 in the future, have the two bishops. I don't know. It, what's nice about the Nimzo Larsen opening is that there's, there's, you don't have to memorize every single line um, to get into a good position. As long as you know the setup and you know the ideas of the game, then you will do really, really well up until 2000 level. Honestly, this opening has helped um, get to expert level. Okay, Bishop a5 was played in the game. After a3, we have to understand that this knight is the only defender of the pawn on e5. Black, Black's best move actually to play bishop d6 or bishop to e7. 
because then the bishop won't get under attack again. If, if we get a chance to play b4 and b5 and remove the defender of the knight, we will achieve the pawn on e5. Okay, so a3. I, in this position, bishop a5 leads to a loss of a pawn. This is a pretty bad move. Bishop c5, it doesn't lead to a loss of a move, uh, like, sorry, a loss of a pawn. However, um, it would be a loss of a tempo for black. So if bishop goes to c5, pawn goes to b4, and now this bishop has to defend the pawn on e5. So the bishop would have to go to d6, and now there is two defenders on the pawn on e5, so black is safe. However, black, as you can see, has wasted two moves. Because they moved the bishop to b4, then they moved the bishop to c5, and now they're moving the bishop to d6. played was bishop to a5, and as mentioned, this just goes into a lot attacking the bishop. The bishop's only move is to play bishop to b6. Now we play pawn to b5. And remove the defender of the pawn on e5. Okay, so black. And I noticed that I'm losing the pawn on e5. My first reaction would be, where can the black knight move? Maybe do a counterattack on a white piece. The sad part in this position is that it is not possible. There's no safe moves um, to attack another white piece. So blacks. To move knight to a5, knight c to e7, and knight back to e7. In the game, knight c7 was played, and now we've removed the defender and we can capture the five. In the Nimzo Larsen, it's actually quite common that people fall into the trap of using the pawn on e5, and which is kind of why I do recommend it uh, for, for lower level. Okay, so after bishop takes e5, as you can see, this bishop is not done yet. Bishop has captured the pawn on e5 and now is threatening pawn on g7. Now, the pawn on g there's actually a trap of the rook. Now, one of the main reasons why I recommend my students to play To those of you who don't know, a fiend bishop probably should look. Keto bishop is basically, the, um, it's when you create this pawn structure, the bishop hides. That's just the fast forward uh, variation of explaining um, what it is. So, oh, sorry, continuing on in the. Okay, so as I mentioned, why fiend keto bishop? In Kero Bishop, a lot of people, they forget about this bishop, and this bishop is very, very powerful on this diagonal. Now, especially in the Nimzo Larsen, a lot of people tend to fall in losing the rook. Now, it's not always that you know, a loss of a rook tends to happen, so it's quite common, but um, I've, I've had, like, my students, uh, play against other people and they would at least win the pawn on g7 maybe they didn't like it. now in this position uh, black did make a mistake um, and play pawn to d6 however if we if, if black wants to defend g7 pawn they would have to either pink probably not a good idea because then uh, black cannot castle. Uh, you can play pawn to f6. I know that moving the f pawn, some people would be terrified about it, but in chess, it's really important to calculate. So if you if you if you notice that after queen h5, 
uh, black can just block, then you should be good. See? Queen h5 would actually be a really bad move for white because the pawn would go to g6, and now both the queen and the bishop are in danger. So uh, white would just move back to b2 and then uh, continue the development. It's actually a really, really good position for white. It's like we can play a4, give more to play d4 and c4, and as you can see, this is just going to be a really, really good pawn structure, and then just a development, really, really good development. Another move that black could do is knight to f6. I don't think that it's the best move, because maybe we can consider as white to trade off, create double pawns, and then now the two f pawns could be in danger. It's really up to you. I personally wouldn't do it because I like my bishop on e5, but it's really by preference. Okay, pawn goes to d6, he misses, bishop takes g7, and now his rook is in danger. His or her, sorry. They're one of the reasons why um, when I talk about the opponent, I tend to say he, and it's because there are significantly more people, like males, who play chess. So, for example, uh, it, there would be an 80% chance that the opponent uh, would be, probably around 80% chance that the opponent would be uh, a, a boy or a man. So please don't take that offensively um, in the video. Okay, bishop takes g7, knight goes to g6. Now in this position, I don't think that there was a rush to capture on h8, but I don't blame my students. They don't want to wait uh, because, right, um, maybe there, was, there, there could be a miscalculation. So my student decided to capture on h8 right away. Not a problem. Knight takes h8, and then he plays pawn to f4. Uh, I definitely think in this position it would be interesting to consider to play queen h5 right away, um, uh, but my student is following the Nimzo Larsen. There are two different setups to the Nimzo Larsen. Um, I'm not going to explain it in this video. As I mentioned, there will be a future video about, uh, about the Nimzo Larsen lines. Um, but this is just one of the ways um, that you would play in the Nimzo Larsen. Uh, so either you play f4 or you play like uh, d4 and c4 variation. Yeah, so in this position, maybe queen h5 would be an interesting idea um, to threaten this pawn, um, or just developing the knight, or just taking control over the center. f4 was not needed to play. Um, however, as I mentioned, what's good about this opening is that um, you are not going to be penalized with how you play. Um, a lot of the time, as long as you, you are just playing, you are playing um, good moves, good moves to activate your pieces, control the center, and bring your king to safety, then it's a good plan. The pawn goes to f4, protects the center, which is why I like it. Uh, keep in mind, queen h4 is actually not very threatening because we would simply play pawn to g3. I think this is actually would be a waste of a turn for black. Queen e7. Um, what is the queen doing here? Not really that much. As you can see, the pawn is protecting uh, the pawn on e3. I think in this position, instead of queen to e2 and blocking off this bishop, a better move would have just been to uh, develop. Because if any of you were considering the sacrifice, the sacrifice would actually be not a very good idea because um, not only is it a fair, like, um, it's not a trade. Uh, black would be losing another point. And not only that, there would be a queen trade. When you're down material, you do not want to have a queen trade. But of course, when you are up material, it's good to trade queens because you are removing a defender for your, sorry, you're removing a, 
a strong defender, but you are also removing a strong attacker against you in the future. Which is why it's good to trade queens when you're up. Remove that really strong piece. Because believe me, when it comes to checkmating patterns, if you notice, a lot of checkmating patterns involve queens. Okay, let's go back. Now, I always teach my students to be very aware of all of any type of, you know, consequences that could happen in the game. So I don't blame my student for wanting to play queen e2. I uh, wanted to play queen e2, defend this pawn, and develop later. I assume that maybe this bishop will go to g2, maybe. Okay, knight goes to f6. Knight goes to f3, development, very good. Bishop goes to g4, pinning the knight. Okay, queen goes to d3. Goes to d3. So in this, in this, uh, so this move, I assume that my student uh, moved the queen out of the way just to not be in the pin. However, there's there's one thing that, of course, um, that white needs to be somewhat careful about. By moving queen to d3, this actually allows black to ruin the king side. So if they wanted to make sure that white doesn't castle on this side, the bishop would capture on f3, and then maybe black can try to play h4. Um, that kind of happens later on in the game, but this is just something that I'm saying you have to course consider. If this doesn't bother you, and I think with my student it didn't bother him, because of course uh, there was, we do have more material um, in this position, but. Okay, so that was not played. Knight to d7 was played, and from my understanding, knight to d7 is with the idea of playing knight to c5, um, and it's also to open up the queen. Exactly. So it's also to open up the queen for future uh, queen h4. In this position, I think the best move may have been to play queen takes h7, because after queen takes h7, uh, maybe threatening the knight. Now, there is one thing I actually don't like about queen takes h7, and in a chess game, you should always be looking out for these moves. Or, sorry, you should be looking out for the strategy. Um, when a queen captures like a pawn on the seventh rank, there is a possibility, or the second rank, playing black, there is a possibility that the queen might get trapped. So in this position, it is a free pawn, and it's going to be an aggressive move. But one thing is if the queen captures on h7, knight goes to g6, and now you just have to be aware that your queen might get trapped. I don't think... It will, uh, because we can decide to maybe move the queen. Um, we can maybe move the queen to g7, and then try to escape. But if your opponent is very very keen on trying to trap your queen, they might. I don't know. They might play something like knight to f6 and try to take away squares. It's not fully trapped, but. Uh, when from playing chess for a really long time, I always look at all the consequences my opponent, all the all the different possible moves, and I try to imagine myself in my opponent's shoes. That actually might be the best strategy. Um, sometimes it's good to imagine yourself playing your opponent so you can see the moves that he might, he or she might to make. So in a way it's probably a good thing my student did not capture on h7 even though it's very tempting. Okay so knight c3 was played which is which is a good move. It's a development. Protects this pawn controlling the center. Bishop takes f3, g takes f3, queen h4. Now I don't know if my student necessarily saw queen h4 here. Uh, however, the king is actually fairly safe on d1. It doesn't look like it, but once we play bishop to um, uh, 
uh, E2. Actually, all of the pieces are surrounding. I know it doesn't feel like the king is safe, but the king is actually more safe in the center of the board than on than than on the queen side or the king side, because both of those sides are more open. Okay, so king goes to d1, castle makes sense. Bishop e2 development good, protecting the pawn on f3. Knight goes to g6. Yep, trying to get the knight out, get the knight into. A4. I like this move, A4. Um, this move, A4, it is trying to trap the bishop. I, I mean, the, the bishop actually can't get trapped right away um, because the bishop can escape here. But especially if this square gets occupied, then white can decide to trap. Now, my student made a really big mistake here. So when the knight went to C5, I guess... You know the thought process was oh the bishop's trapped right without thinking of the consequent like without thinking of the current move that has been made right the knight moved to c5 and it's attacking the queen now um please these type of moves they happen in chess you you really need to make mistakes to become a better improved by only winning because if you only win games, it means that you are not challenging yourself. And making mistakes like this, they, I mean, it is sad. It is definitely very, very sad. But each game that you play, you hope that you won't make the, that mistake. And maybe just think a little bit more on your move. So knight goes to c5. In this position, the best move would have been maybe just move your queen to f5. Check. And if the king moves away, then the bishop gets trapped. Now, interesting enough, um, in this position, I believe that the bishop gets trapped anyways, even if the knight goes to e6. So if the knight blocks and opens up the way for the bishop, white can play pawn to a5, bishop goes to c5, pawn goes to d4, attacking the bishop again. And now we are going to do our final attack, which is knight to d5. And now the bishop is trapped. Uh, please, please be careful. Of course, there's the queen, but as you can see, this rook is guarding the checkmate. Very, very important. Always look at the consequences. Like, always look at what you're doing. Okay. So keep in mind, um, my student, he makes a blunder, um, his queen is hanging. However, keep in mind that we did win exchange. Uh, we did win, at least it's not so bad. And actually my, uh, my student ended up still winning this game, which is pretty cool. So never give up, please. Never give up, always play until the very end. A5. Ah, really, really sad. Okay, so after this move, from my understanding, my student was not very. In my opinion, he made another mistake, which um, it's better. It's better to capture with the pawn. At least, um, at least, in the end, you're going to have an, a, a bishop and a rook for the queen, which actually isn't bad at all, right? Because if the pawn captures the knight, now the bishop's in danger. The bishop has only one move, and we can continue on with this idea. Pawn goes to d4, attack the bishop again. The bishop's only safe square is bishop to b4. And now knight goes to five, and the bishop's trapped. Uh, the, by the way, the reason why the bishop is trapped, if any of you guys were wondering about this move on c5, there's actually en passant. En passant, and now, um, now a pawn cannot capture the bishop.
So it is kind of common that when you make a mistake, that sometimes another mistake follows after. So, you know, sometimes you're just really upset at yourself over the move that you made. Um, but knight takes d3, um, captures on b6. Now, I can actually kind of understand this move. Uh, probably the reason why capturing why capturing here first is because threatening to capture the knight on d3, but also th threatening to capture the pawn on a7 and then promoting. However, I believe uh, black has knight 2 f2 check. Uh, white's gonna have to play king to c1. Otherwise, you're moving the queen, uh, sorry, the king under the same diagonal as the queen. Not a good idea. Uh, knight takes h1. Pawn goes to, uh, pawn captures a7, threatening to promote, and black can play king to d7 here and sacrifice the rook for the promoted pawn. And Sadly, it won't be enough. I, it won't be enough material for white. Not enough compensation. And also, like there are moves like queen e1 and knight f2 coming in for black, which is also not really ideal for white. Okay. Well, Black didn't do the most accurate moves either and actually missed knight to f2 in this position. Um, but a takes b6, c takes b6. I'm not 100% sure like why, why didn't black just capture on um, with the a pawn. It wouldn't ruin the pawn structure and on top of that rook a8 might be something that black wants because black is up material. They want to trade queens. Sorry, they want to trade pieces, not white wanting to trade pieces. So not 100% sure what uh, black's thought process is there. Maybe he wanted to create more fleeing squares for the king. Uh, C takes d3. Um, not 100% sure if capturing with the pawn or the bishop is better. Um, bishop looks better, but... Capturing with a pawn potentially gives chances, right? Attacking chances. Here. Actually, white is up material, right? Uh, up to... Or... No, it's equal. Sorry, it's equal now. Um, white isn't up material, but that's really cool, right? I mean, it's pretty cool that you lose the queen in the middle of the game, but now you're, you have the equal amount of points. Okay, queen goes to f6. Um, I think the reason why black made this move is to encourage white to play knight to d5 and then hope that we miss the rook on a1. However, I mean, if there's a free pawn, we may as well capture it, right? Right, right, come on. King to b8. Um, so in this position, knight d5 looks very, very tempting because now there is no rook on a1. But please be careful with moves like this because if you play, if you play knight to d5, uh, what can happen is what can happen is black can play queen to e6, and now both the knight and the rook are both in danger. Okay, so rook takes a7, king goes to b8, rook goes to a3. I really like um, that rook a3 was played. This is a really good spot for the rook because it gives extra protection to the knight. Um, it's also on a dark square. Uh, it's not very easily attacked. Maybe even rook a4 would have been another uh, good opportunity as well. Um, it's really hard to attack. Um, rook to c8. So when this move got played, uh, one thing you guys should keep in mind is I like creating ideas. So even though the rook can't go to a8 right now, but imagine if the rook would be able to go to a8, then maybe we could win the queen, 
right? These are just some things to think about. Or if there were two rooks here, then the knight could go to d5 and then threaten checkmate. Um, really kind of interesting idea. Okay, so d4 was played uh, to kind of like block off this, 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 uh, this diagonal. Because if you play knight to d5 right away, there might be an interesting, an interesting move with queen to b2 for black. And now there is uh, multiple checkmates actually uh, being threatened here. So I'm glad that my students saw that. Glad d4 was played first. Okay, knight goes to e7. So black is stopping the knight from going to d5. Pawn goes to d3, not exactly sure. Ideas being into d2, okay, okay. Getting the rooks, getting the other rook involved. Queen goes to d6, okay, attacking the rook on a3. Doubling up, very good. King goes to c7. Uh, if I were to, if I were to play black, it wouldn't be scary to have this move played because uh, we would want to have a trade. But king goes to c7. But I guess, but I guess now white is actually up a pawn, so maybe trading off material isn't that great. But I think I still think that queen is better than a bishop and a rook in a lot of cases, though. Rook goes to a8, trying to trade. Okay, okay. I mean, white is up one point, so trading. Uh, makes sense from that point of view. Queen goes to b4. Ouch. Ooh. Queen b4. Now, queen b4 is actually not the scary move here because I did look at this game before I, of course, made this video and I, uh, before I made this analysis. But queen b4, this should be a trigger. So queen b4, it looks like a really good move because it threatens b2 and it does technically create a threat. However, in this position here, after queen goes to b4, notice how the king and the queen are placed on the board. They are placed in a potential royal fork situation. So after queen goes to b4, king goes to c2, and uh, black makes a mistake and plays knight to f5. This is the queen. So in chess, in my opinion, I think that you should play all the way until the very end because the game is not over until it's over. And as you can see, my student um, just lost, uh, he did lose his queen just from uh, being too focused on his own plan without noticing what um, his opponent was attacking and still managed to um, get into a better position. So in this position, even if Black did not. Even even if Black um, did not uh, fall for knight to d5, what White could be considering is playing something like rook to e8 and then creating a sacrifice and winning back. Um, I do believe that this queen b4 move uh, simply gives chances for White. White needs to take advantage of. So after king goes to c2, uh, what could black play? I mean, black could play something like king to um, king to d6. Uh, but here's the problem: if king goes to d6, look, this queen on b4 is now uh, is now actually trapped. Uh, the queen's only route was to go back diagonally. Now we can play rook to a4. Um, okay, let's say king d6 does not get played. Okay, let's say king d7 gets played. Okay, well, if king d7 gets played, well, we still have a lot of other ideas that we can do. Well, number one, um, what about trying to get rid of this knight that's defending the pawn on d5? Uh, or another thing we can do is, I don't know, even just even just go and try to capture the pawn on h7. Remember, white is up um, a point here, and I believe uh, once the bishop on e2 becomes active, uh, we could continue, we could even think about playing something like bishop f1 and bishop h3. Well, in this position, after knight goes to f5, uh, black did resign after knight takes d5, because 
uh, white is going to be up a significant amount of material. Like, black didn't, like, black lost the queen for nothing. It's not even that, it's a pawn and a queen. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. There's going to be more of these videos uh, talking about my students' games, and I will be starting the series. I'm going to be starting two series soon, a series on my own games in the Nimzo Larson and the Sicilian Dragon, and I will also be creating a Nimzo Larson opening um, YouTube series. I used to have one on YouTube, but sadly it got deleted, and I know everyone really enjoyed that YouTube series, but hopefully this new one is going to be even better. Hope all of you have an amazing day, and keep chessin'!